places. I have to always do that because uh, there are some places where we go to worship that um, and, um, people are a little bit timid. Amen. I, I'd rather use that term than some other terms. Amen. A little bit timid about praising the Lord and really feel in their hearts uh, that there is something a little bit weird about getting excited about Jesus. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, when I was pastoring in the South Georgia Conference, who pastored really one of our really high steeple churches, uh, uh, told me that uh, when he first noticed this, uh, was that he had a group of seniors that he had the responsibility because uh, the regular van driver could not take them to a, um, a Braves baseball game. And as pastor, you do know that uh, in the fine print of job descriptions for all pastors, amen, there's this little phrase and all other duties that nobody else will be able to do, amen, or can do. And so it fell his responsibility to carry the, uh, the senior members of the church uh, to drive them from South Georgia up to Atlanta to attend a Braves baseball game. And he said he'd been pastoring that church for a couple of years, and, and a lot of times he'd preach his heart out. And those little ladies would just sit there and kind of, every now and then they would bow. And after church, they'd just look at him like, you know, pitiful pastor. Um, but he went to this Braves game, and it happened that that game, the Braves were down. They were losing. And um, it was eighth or ninth inning, and all of a sudden, the Braves started rallying, you know. And the team uh, got a base hit, and somebody walked, and someone else got a base hit, and looked like there was hope. And he said, all of a sudden, those little ladies started standing up, and, come on, Braves! Get a hit! And finally, somebody got a home run, and those ladies jumped up, and they were, Whoa! hollering and screaming and, and he said Lord what in the world has happened to the ladies in my church and said now I know I work just as hard as the Braves were working on Sunday morning but I've never gotten that kind of a response and so I know there are places amen where people are a little timid about praising the Lord and they feel that somehow there is something wrong with it, but those same folk can leave their churches. Oh, y'all don't hear me. Well, they are timid about praising God, but can go to a Braves baseball game or in the southeast where we almost worship football, amen, and go to a football game and shout for joy over a momentary victory rather than the eternal glory of Almighty God. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Oh, bless his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Bless God. Holy name. Come on. Give him some praise in this house. Oh, bless his name. Oh, thank you. Glory. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See, I, I know why I praise him, amen. I praise him because he woke me up this morning. Started me out on another day's journey. I praise him because he's been better to me than I've been to myself. I praise him because when I had nothing, I knew underneath me were his everlasting arms. That when... Uh, depression and uh, a spirit of defeat tried to overcome me. I heard him say, greater is he who's within me than he who is in the world. And so I can't help but to praise him and to give him all glory, all honor, and to shout hallelujah. Ho! Oh, oh, Ho! Oh. Ho! Bless his holy name. Yeah, yeah. Amen, 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 amen. Now, I know that's a little bit kind of different than what you used to hear, amen, in some circles. But I just love him because he first loved me. 
And I don't mind if you have your Bibles, your Bibles, amen, and you want to read along with me, I, I would ask you to go to the fifth chapter of our Lord's Gospel according to the writing of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 13, and I will conclude with verse 16. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, and concluding with verse 16. Amen. And I'll ask you to please stand in honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. Matthew 5, beginning at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? It's good for nothing, except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand, and it shines on all who are in the house. In that same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. This is God's word given for us, the very people of God. And the people said, Amen. you may be seated. And now, God, I pray you let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for indeed you are our strength, and we bless you that you are our Redeemer. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray, and we give you thanks for it. Let every heart say amen. amen. I want to thank uh, Rick. Um, for this opportunity to come and to be with you. And let me just briefly say this, and I'm, we'll get back to the, to the sermon. But I want to just briefly say this. Some people may wonder, well, what in the world? Uh, it's kind of unusual for bishops to come and to be a part of a gathering like this. Well, I would just say to you, about three years ago when Rick invited me to come and I took the invitation, I was sort of like one of the persons who spoke earlier who said that, you know, you go kind of looking to be a blessing and you wind up being blessed. Events like this are a blessing to me as a bishop because not only did I get a chance uh, uh, to have the opportunity to, uh, to minister, but I get a chance to be ministered to. Uh, each time I've had the chance to work the altar, while I was praying, somebody always lays their hand on me and prays for me as well. And I don't know how many times um, you think about or even allow your soul or your life to be uh, inspired to pray for your bishop or to pray for your pastor even. Because those who minister find themselves given so much. Amen, y'all that we need to be ministered to. And when I come to this, and I don't call it a conference, amen. I, I just call it uh, a spiritual experience, amen. That, that, that sounds real Methodist anyway, amen. It's, just, it's, it's a spiritual experience. I mean, I just come, and the reason I get so pumped is because I haven't learned how to be a bishop yet, amen. I, I, I really, um, I come, and first and foremost, I come to worship. That's what I come to, and I just get all caught up in the worship, and, and I don't even know I'm bishop till some of y'all fool around and remind me of it, amen. And when I'm walking through the crowd, I say, hey, bishop, and I go, like, yeah, okay, yeah, right. Uh, but I come to worship, and when I worship, and when I give God praise, it blesses my life, and I feel the power and the magnitude of God for my life, so that's one of the reasons I'm here, amen. It's because it's an opportunity for me to come and to be blessed. Now, my wife, Delphine, would be here too, but she is recovering from surgery, uh, uh, some emergency surgery, rather, to her left foot, and she would have been here because she is at home, well, recuperating and fussing each night when I call her and tell her what happened. Well, I should have been there. I, I 
I just should have been there. Because whenever she comes, she doesn't do anything but worship and enjoy herself and get to know everybody. And uh, she just wanted me to make sure I tell you that she said hello, amen. So, so, when you, so when you see her, make sure you tell her that I did what I was supposed to do. Amen. <laughs> All right. Matthew tells us of this wonderful preaching experience, teaching experience of Jesus. Where people gather on a hillside for Jesus to tell them what it would be like to be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of his movement. And I'm pretty sure that everybody who showed up that day to hear Jesus preach were not people who had already made a commitment to follow Jesus. I think sometimes we forget about the fact that in the first century, Jesus really had obtained almost the status of a rock star. And you need to hear this. Because in that day and time, great speakers like Jesus, persons who could do the things that Jesus was able to do, even to a lesser degree, when they came to town, the word got around. And it was like a great event for everybody to come out and to see and hear this man. His reputation preceded him. And so when he showed up, everybody who came did not come because they were committed to Christ. Do you hear this? See, everybody who shows up even here, Lord have mercy, who comes to rekindling the flame. Amen. Is that it? That's it. The flame. Amen. Everybody who comes is not thoroughly committed. Many people come purely out of curiosity. They want to see if this is for real. And on that day that Jesus was doing this teaching, everybody who showed up did not come because they were committed nor acquainted with the intimate details of what it meant to follow Jesus. In fact, some of even the apostles, if you follow the story of Jesus, even up to his death, were not fully informed, nor did they really truly comprehend all that it would mean to follow Jesus. In fact, some of us who were here, I mean, we shout a good game, amen. Come on, y'all. I mean, we really do. It, it, I mean, it feels good when uh, the band is playing. Amen. And we shout and we go through all of the emotional uh, experience of it all. And, and don't, don't get me wrong, I include myself in it. My God, I love to get my shout in too. Amen. I love lifting my hands and getting my two-step in. I enjoy it to the highest but I know that as I walk with Jesus, that what he enticed me with 30 and 40 years ago, I found out today was a deeper walk than what I anticipated when I first signed up for his merry band. Give him a hand clap of praise. <laughs> that he requires and asks much more out of me than what I initially anticipated. And so on that day as everybody came out to hear Jesus, Jesus began to sort of tell them, if you're going to follow me, then you need to understand this. But though Jesus was fully cognizant of the fact that everybody who was there was not committed, and even among the 12 and the outer circle, because there were more people who followed Jesus than just the 12, y'all. Y'all do know that, amen? But even among the outer circle, Jesus was fully aware that they did not fully understand what they had signed up to do by following him, and he wanted to make this thing clear. He also knew that there were people in the crowd, amen? who didn't even have the best of intentions. Some who wanted to take advantage of his popularity. 
who wanted him to do things that were not on his agenda. But despite it all, Jesus does not turn them away. I mean, listen to this. He knew what they were up to. The Bible makes it clear. He said, the Bible says that of Jesus, he needed nobody to tell him what was in people or what they were thinking because he knew people and he knew even the thoughts and intents of their hearts. So when you're sitting in church, amen, and you're thinking thoughts that are ungodly thoughts, or you're thinking about things that do not add up to the gospel of Jesus Christ, God still hears it anyhow, but he doesn't kick you out of the church. Give him a hand clap of praise anyhow. Listen. Listen here. And despite all that he knew about them, that some of them were robbers and thieves and cutthroats and prostitutes and gamblers and all of those things, listen to what he says. He says, you, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. He still says, you are the salt of the earth. Give him a hand clap. Hey, bless his name. You are the light of the world. Listen, listen, listen. Jesus doesn't wait, my brother. He doesn't wait, my sister, until you get cleaned up, until you get your life straight, until you learn how to dance just right. He doesn't even wait until you know all of the verses of Amazing Grace, until you know the Apostles' Creed without looking in the hymn book. Amen. He doesn't wait until you attend Sunday school like you ought to or until you let somebody help you with that voice that you can't control. Jesus immediately bestows upon you the title of being the salt of the earth, a city set on the hill, the light of the world. Oh, hallelujah. Bless his name. Now, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Because, see, I know some church folk are not used to that kind of talk. See, see, we used to folk talking bad about us. That you a wretch undone and a worm. Well, let me, let me ask you a question. Can I, can I ask you a question? Can I ask you one? If you fall into a ditch, do you need me to come along and tell you you in the ditch? I mean, talk to me. If you're in the ditch, do you need me to come along and tell you you're in a ditch? If you are a wretch undone, if you know yourself the way you ought to, you don't need me on Sunday morning to tell you just how bad you are. You already know how bad you are. Jesus, in saying you are the light of the world, you are city sit on the hill, you are the salt of the earth, Jesus was trying to reverse our thinking. He was trying to take us back to the garden when God created us. Because when God created us, God said it is Come on, y'all can't even say it. You're afraid of it. God said, you are. Come on, say it again. Maybe this side can say it better than that side. You are. What about this side? Can you say, you are. Y'all didn't do it right. Let's, you are. You are. Everybody, you are. Give him a hand clap of praise. Oh, bless his holy name. Now, now listen. It, it doesn't mean that there are things wrong with you, but you've got to accept the fact that God did not create you to be the sinner that you are. God created you to give God a perfect praise. Now give him some praise in this house. Oh, bless his holy name. Listen, God was trying to call out of you that which God placed in you what the world is trying to do with you 
is to distort the gift that's already in you. Let me help you with this. When I was a little boy growing up, amen, I got a bad message. I grew up in a world here in the United States that was so race conscious that it was a sin. And I couldn't escape it growing up in Houston, Texas. I happened to be the youngest in that family. My two sisters, Helen and Lola Faye, uh, because of all kind of stuff that's a part of our history as African Americans in, in the United States, they were high yellow, we call them. Now, if you don't know what that is, we'll talk later on. Amen. And, and if that offends you, Lord help you. My God. But they were high yellow. Amen. And there was no denying the fact that I was a black boy. Amen. Uh, it, it showed up real good. Amen. And in our community, we had this saying. It was this, this is the way it kind of went around. It said, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, get back. Well, what did that say to me? Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And as a result of it, I grew up with some negative feelings about myself because of the color of my skin, which meant that I was born this way, but there was nothing I could do about it. Are you hearing me here? Oh, don't y'all get all uptight. Lord, God has, has delivered me from that stuff a long time ago. I'm trying to help you to understand something. And, and so I thought that somehow there was something wrong with me until my sister did something. And this is what she did. She had a boyfriend. And back in that day and time, girls were not supposed to call boys. Are you here? Are, are, you got me? Are you feeling me? Oh, you, get, give it to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so to get around mama's edict, her and her boyfriend cooked up a scheme. He had a sister about my age. And so she would call. Are you getting this? And ask for Lola. And then Lola and this boy McCoy would talk. What just happened that she called one day and I answered the phone. And she said, hello. And I said, hello, how you doing? She said, fine. And she kind of hesitated. And then she said, uh, is Lola there? I said, yes, she is. She said, may I speak to her? I said, sure. And I gave her the phone. When they started talking, Lola just broke out laughing again. I said, what in the world's going on? She said, well, I'll tell you later on. Well, after Lola got off the phone, I said, well, what were you laughing about? She said, oh, Lord. McCoy, sister, just think you got the most sexiest voice she's ever heard. <laughs> oh. Now here's this little black boy who's struggling with his identity, with his color, but he's finding out that he's got a sexy voice. <laughs> you know, you know, man, and Lou Rawls is in trouble, amen. And so, so what, I, what I did was I started getting ready for that phone to ring. Amen. And every time the phone rung, I said, hello. <laughs> you know, I, I work with that thing. Amen. But what was happening here is that Satan was trying to get me to take the gift, Lord Jesus, that God was going to use later on to preach the gospel and use it for my own selfish purposes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God has gifted every last one of you with a gift. What Satan tries to do is to distort the gift, pollute the gift, mess it up to the point where you use it in a way that does not glorify God but glorifies you where you get the credit where you get the praise and when I finally said yes to God was when I began to understand that the gift God gave me in a voice was not for me but it was for the glory of almighty God come on give him some praise oh bless his holy name bless his name 
That's why God can say to you, even when you are born, you are the earth. So you turn to that person next to you. Come on quickly, because I don't have much time. Turn to that person and say, and say to them, you are the salt of the earth. And then look at yourself, point at yourself. Come on, say, I am the salt of the earth. Give God some praise. Oh, bless his name. Hallelujah. Say, listen. And let me run through this right quick so, so, so we can all be, be, be free with this here. God is trying to tell us, and by the way, for, since I forgot to give the subject, for those of you who need the subject, the subject is plainly you are, amen. That's all it is. You are, amen. Now, if, if you needed to really be broken down, I would really say you is, amen. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, you are. Listen, listen. Three quick things. You are, therefore, he must need you. If Jesus is out here recruiting, and I believe he is. For he says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Listen, listen. No one comes to the Father but by me. You don't come on your own recognizance. You come because God draws you. You are here at rekindling the flame. Not because you registered and paid the fee, but because God drew you here. And it was God that wanted you here on this very night that you might hear you are the salt of the earth. Give him some praise. Oh, bless his name. You are. And if you are being recruited by God, God must need you because, see, and I get so sick of this. I hear preachers say it all the time. Only reason I'm preaching is God made me preach. Poppycock. <laughs> God didn't make you preach. No, sir. He said, with tender, loving kindness have I drawn you. Now, he didn't make you preach. No, 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 no. God made us with free will for us to choose because love ain't love unless you freely choose to love. And you should not be preaching unless you're in love with preaching the word of God. If you mount the pulpit and you mad and you disgruntled and you want God to give you a pink slip, come see me. I got one for you. God have mercy. You ought to be happy every time you get behind the sacred desk. Every time somebody asks you to preach, you ought to be on ready. You ought to say, it's like fire. Shut up in my bones. Hey. Oh, bless his name. You ought to sing because you are happy. God needs you. That's why God is recruiting is because God has need of you. You are his recruits. I, I got happy tonight when the, when, the, when the drummer started playing that kind of cadence, that military cadence. Did you hear it tonight? When, 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 when the song was singing? To, to those of you who are not military, you didn't hear it. I heard that military. I kind of looked back at him and smiled, and I didn't know whether he knew why I, why I was smiling. Man, I, I, I started, man. I straightened up my back. I about ready to salute. Amen. Do you hear what I'm saying? You are his recruits. God needs you. God wants you to be able to use you for the glory and the honor of God's kingdom. Secondly, not only are you his recruits, but you are recipients of Jesus' power. I almost fell at my seat when the preacher this morning went to that Mark text about the woman with the issue of blood. Because I said, no, no, stay away from there. Because I'm going to talk about that tonight, amen. Just leave that alone, amen. I, but but you, you got to understand in that text, 
where Jesus gets out the boat and Jairus meets him and says, my daughter is sick unto death and you need to go and heal her. On the way to heal Jairus' daughter, Jesus gets surrounded by a crowd. Listen to this. And Jesus is just trying to make his way through the crowd. On his way to heal Jairus' daughter. There's a woman in the crowd, Lord Jesus, thank you, Holy Ghost, who's not supposed to be in the crowd. See, y'all missed that. She's not supposed to be there because she had that issue of blood. And ceremonially, she was not supposed to be hanging out with the public because she had that issue of blood. Because anybody who touched her would now be declared unclean. And they had to go and do the proper purification rites, and then they could not be with Jesus. So she had no business being there. There are some folk here tonight who have no business being in this place. Oh, I want you to hear this. Thank you, Jesus, for this revelation. You weren't supposed to be here tonight. You slipped up in here. Amen. Yeah. Oh, you busted. Amen. Oh, big time busted. You are not supposed to be in here, but you slipped up in this place and you came in. This woman said, sure, I spent all my money with doctors trying to get well. And instead of getting well, I got worse. And they told me this man, Jesus, can heal. All I want to do is get close enough to him so I can just touch his garment. If I can do that, I know I'm going to be made whole. He doesn't have to really touch me to break my chain. Oh, hallelujah. He doesn't have to touch me to break my chain. I just want to touch him. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I, I, don't, I don't even have to give him a high five. No, I can't mess it. I, I, I just want to get a hold to his cloth. If, if I can just do that, I'll be made whole. Now, 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 Jesus is going on his merry way. Crowd pressing in. Excuse me. Excuse me. Jairus' daughter needs me. Y'all blocking the way. I got to go. Armor bearers get me through. I, I, I need to go. Then all of a sudden, this woman touches Jesus' cloth. The woman testifies for herself in the scripture. And she says, immediately, Lord have mercy. Now, she didn't go through anointing with all. <laughs> Lord have mercy. None of that stuff. But immediately, the blood that had been running rapidly out of her was dried up. Immediately. Are you hearing this? Now, I want to ask another question. I don't want to mess y'all up, but I got to ask it. How many of y'all believe that? Amen. Now, are you hearing? Immediately, that woman's blood dried up. And then this is what happened. Jesus, almost, in fact, simultaneously, when the woman touched him, before, Lord have mercy, before she was healed, Jesus turned around. Somebody touch me. Lord have mercy. Come here, Rick. Come here. Come here. Come here quickly. Oh, Lord. Come, come on down. Come on down. Come here, Sharma. Amen. No, there were women in the crowd. Come on up here. Come, 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 come rest y'all. Come here quickly. Come on, come on, come on. You're messing up my illustration. Amen. Yeah. They pressing all in on Jesus. They pressing all. They, and everybody just touching him all over the place. Somebody touch me. Ah, yeah. Somebody. Disciples said, Jesus, you must be crazy. All of these folks at rekindling the flame 
and you talking about somebody touched you? Jesus said, well, you really didn't hear me. What I said, the only reason I knew somebody touched me is that power, Lord, have mercy, went out of me. Are you hearing this? Power went out of me. Now, you don't know if power goes out of you if you never had power. If you're not used to handling power, you don't know when you lose power. Oh, God Almighty, y'all need to hear this. The problem with our church is that we don't know we lost power because we never had power. Oh! 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 Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you don't know you got it, you don't know when you lose it. That's why folks sometimes will show up and they see stuff going on and they get up and walk out because they've never seen it before. And they deny it with plausible deniability. It can't be true because in the last 40 to 50 years, we've never seen it. Now, I suggest to you it goes back farther than that. I think it goes back to the turn of the century when we had folk like this yeah, yeah. in the church yeah, yeah. and it was regular in the church for Methodists to be shouting folk. In fact, our history tell us that in our camp meetings, we used to bark like dogs. We used to make so much noise that in camp meetings, folk would run through the woods to be with the Methodists because our songs would go through the trees, get on the riverbanks, and float in the homes, and folk would get saved who did not even come to the camp meeting. And it wasn't because of us. Lord have mercy. It was because, it was because of the power. Somebody say power. It was the power that went out of them that God put in them. But when you don't have power, you're not used to power, you don't know when you've lost it. If we're not used to laying hands on folk and seeing them heal, when we got ritual and we think that Jesus is in the ritual rather than in the person, Lord. Jesus, man, who's performing the ritual. We start replacing the ritual with the person and we start thinking that the salvation is in the ritual and the salvation and the healing is in the power of Almighty God. Give him a hand clap of praise. Give him a hand clap. Give him a hand clap. Give him a hand clap. In this text, what Jesus does is that Jesus not only recruits you, but Jesus gives you power. Come on, people. There's a black comedian who says it this way. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Amen. What you see when, when you come to the altar, Rick laying hands, Bishop Lockman laying hands, the rest of the altar team laying hands and folks falling all out and looking like they and drunk some stuff coming out of a tin can. Amen. You think they're the only one got that power? Come on here. Every last one of you. If you've been born again and you've asked God to fill you with his Holy Spirit, every last one of us have the power to lay hands. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, you need to hear this. Now, 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 Lord, how much? Give me some, un, unscrew the top off that water. I need a little water because I'm getting ready to holler a little bit, amen. And then I'm going to be through, right? This, now, I want this water here because this water here is room temperature, amen. I, I don't want something too cold. Mm. Because you see what happens. He says in the end of it that when you do your good works, listen, then people will see it. Your good works. See, that's what we miss. 
your good works. Can I help you quickly? How many of you all have ever read or heard a preacher preach on the Israelites crossing the Red Sea? Have, have you? Have you? You remember the dialogue between God and Moses? Moses says, Lord, you done brought us out here to die. You ran a con game on me. I thought I was going to be the greatest liberator of all time. Mountains on the left, on the right, Pharaoh behind me, and the sea in front of me. Now, what in the world are you going to do? I, I'm, I'm just kind of giving you the Swanson version of it. You mess me up. And God says to Moses, very plain, he said, what about the rod that I gave you? What about the rod I gave you? Don't be crying out to me. Don't ask me to deliver you. That's what God says. Go back and read it. You don't believe me? Check it out. Don't ask me to deliver you. You stretch out the rod. You stretch out the rod. And you part the sea. And when Moses, not God, listen, when Moses stretched out the rod, the sea was parted. God gives you power to do things. That which you cannot do, God handles. Well, what did God handle? I'm glad you asked. Moses could only handle the sea. He couldn't handle the mud. Lord have mercy. Messing with you now. Because once the sea was parted, God sent an east wind. Y'all better start reading this word. God sent an east wind. And the wind blew all night long. So that when the ladies walked through in their high heels, they didn't mess up their nine wests. Amen. Oh, yeah. God. 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 God took care of business. And when they got on the other side, Miriam got the tambourine. And they started giving God praise. Oh, bless his name. Oh, bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. I need somebody. I'm through.